loud. Hey guys, uh, thank you all for joining. Um, I think most of the people on the call uh, on the Zoom session here know me. I'm Rob Kelman. I have a training and coaching company in Metro Detroit and do a lot of agile, uh, agile work. Um, I thought it was uh, very interesting uh, um, when I, I read about Path to Agility and I wanted to introduce it to some of you guys locally. Um, and, and the best way to probably do that would be to have uh, the creator of Path to Agility talk with you and also have Bob Sarney, who I've worked with and done some of the advanced product training, um, join as well because he's one of the uh, practitioners who's learned uh, about Path to Agility and can deliver workshops for it. Um, uh, David Hawks is down in Texas. He's uh, along and Bob Sarney is in Idaho. They're both Certified Scrum Trainers of Scrum Alliance, and they are enterprise coaches, uh, delivering a lot of the same stuff that I do. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Probably they're going to do that as they go through the, the, the PowerPoint. Um, I will stick around in the background. Uh, if you have questions along the way, um, David and Bob, you guys can let people know how the, what kind of flow you want. If you want people to jump in, ask questions, if you want to wait until the end. I think it's about a 35 to a minute or so. 40 minute presentation with time at the end for questions for you. And then, um, you know, if you want to chat a question, I'll be happy to read it or they can read it or um, we'll tell you when you can unmute and ask questions yourself. But David and Bob, I'm gonna hand it over to you and uh, let you guys run with it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Rob. And uh, yeah, we're totally open to questions as we go we'll let you know if we get too chatty and need to kind of press on but um you know feel free to post things in the chat and then we'll we'll try and triage them and work them in um uh, in that so we, we definitely want you know some interaction along the way and uh what we're hoping to kind of share with you around path to agility is kind of some of the some of the challenges and some of the big gotchas, but how um, some kind of a different framework of thinking about uh, approaching transformation. And um, yeah, as Rob said, uh, I was uh, part of the, one of the creators of Path to Agility and uh, I'm down in Austin, Texas. And mostly what I do is focus on helping organizations through transformation. So our, our organization is solely focused on ag agile transformation work. Um, and most of my time is working with kind of leaders around the strategy around transformation. So that's that's part of what um, how I'm going to be kind of showing up and sharing some things with you. I'm sure you all know that agile transformations are really easy and uh, don't take a lot of work and are really quick. Um, but uh, maybe, maybe, you know, there's some challenges and we'll talk about that. Bob, you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, I'll just be really quick. Uh, my name's Bob Sarney. Um, like Rob said, I'm a certified scrum trainer. I'm a certified scrum enterprise coach. Uh, and I, I've been working with organizations probably for the last 17 or 18 years, kind of, uh, you know, help them, help, helping them guide, guide them through the, the change, the changes that need to happen. Uh, while they're going through some transformation, whether it's agile or, or something else. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with, uh, with uh, terms like uh, create a sense of urgency, uh, I think this is really going to resonate with you as, uh, as David starts going through this. And, and um, I add things as well. Yeah. Um, and I, for those that joined a little later, I have a link in the chat um, for just kind of joining in. We're going to be doing a couple of polls just to kind of get y'all's view of the world and one's about to come up. So you can either go to the link that's in the chat or, um, or there's a little code here to follow along on your um, phone. So you could text velocity to 22333. So let's start with kind of the current state of agility. You know, like I said, this agile stuff's really easy. No, it's okay. It's easy to understand, hard to master, right? I mean, the Scrum Guide is only what I think it's down to like 17, 18 pages now. Uh, 13. So, huh? 13, 13 is down yeah. to, in the last one. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it's really simple. <laughs> why, why, why do teams struggle with Scrum? I don't know. It's only 13 pages. <laughs> uh, maybe if it was more pages, it would be uh, better. I don't know. So I want you to think about where you take a take your kind of organization. 
where you might assess kind of the current state of agility for your organization. Is it at this kind of superficial agility where we're kind of going through the motions, but we're kind of more agile than agile or scrum or fall uh, versus really working in a more agile way? Um, are you in kind of an improving state where, hey, we are, yeah, we're good, having good retrospectives, we are starting to improve, we're, we're figuring some of this stuff out, or more predictable agility where, you know, there's very limited carryover from, you know, sprint to sprint, um, teams are really swarming and taking ownership, or um, are you at more of a fast agility where like we're really focused on reducing cycle time, delivering quickly, have good DevOps capability, test automation, things like that. So um, so go ahead and some of you have already jumped in. Let's see where, uh, you know, uh, answer A for superficial, B for improving, C for predictable, D for fast, and let's see where the results come out. Hmm. So it's not so it's not so easy is what what we're seeing so far right so we've got 32 percent superficial 30 70 now 70 percent improving nobody in predictable nobody in fast and um, we're going to talk about that today why is this the case so i've been running this survey for about five years every time i've done a meetup or spoke at the big agile conference or uh, scrum gathering. And what's interesting is the data comes back, has come back pretty uh, consistently in that th the 30% in superficial is pretty common, somewhere around 30%. Uh, improving uh, is usually in this kind of like 50 to 70%. The highest I've seen predictable was 15% and fast at 5%. So why is that the case? Why is it that we have organizations that are in this superficial and improving? So we're gonna talk about this and dig into it. So what happens when we introduce change? Do we get better right away when we introduce change? Everybody's excited about change. Everybody loves change. Um, now we get worse before we get better. This is a standard change curve. You've probably seen this before and, and that, dip into chaos and resistance is a natural human reaction, right? Like change is disruptive. It's scary. Think about the first time you were told, hey, you're going to be doing this agile thing, right? Like it could be that you were tapped on the shoulder. You're going to be a scrum master. And you're like, all right, I'm excited about this new opportunity, but I have no idea how to do that, right? Which is scary, right? It's like I, I knew how to be a hero in the old world. I don't know if I can be a hero in the new world. Right, that, that's the dynamic that's in play. And, and what's, you are all joining this call and I'm, I'm assuming you're in probably some kind of change leadership type of role. Like you as a leader cause change on others, you as a transformation person or an agile coach or a scrum master, we end up causing this curve on others all the time because we go in and we're the ones that are saying, hey, I think there's a new way of working. Let's try it. And while people might be excited to try something, that doesn't mean that they don't have some fear, some stress, something about that. So what happens when we introduce change and we start going down this curve, this chaos and resistance? What, what do you think happens when we get down to the bottom there? And all of a sudden, everything, it, that's like everything's getting really difficult. If we're not clear about why we want to change or we're not motivated by the change, then where do you think people are gonna to wanna to go when it starts to get more and more difficult? Where do you think they're gonna to wanna to clamor back to, right? And, and that's where I think a lot of organizations are in kind of the superficial is because there's not a compelling reason for change. There's not a motivational reason, you know, and, and I don't know how many times I've asked leaders who have, you know, brought us in and you say, okay, so what, what's your goal here? Well, to be agile, that's right. Like that is not gonna motivate anybody to change. Nobody's like, oh, exciting, new process, right? Like, so why do you want to be agile? What is agile going to help us with? And so when we talk about path to agility, one of the really key things that we focus on is what's the outcome that we are after? What's the reason for this change? Because we've got to have everybody motivated to that new status quo. We've got to paint a picture for the future that everybody's excited about, that everybody's going to persevere through this dip because this dip is gonna happen. 
And, and we've oversimplified this change curve because the reality is we have a lot of little change curves, right? Except for probably your organization. Y'all only, y'all only do one major change at a time at your organization, right? Um, how, think about how many, it, it, the rate of change is just happening faster and faster. So what we've set out to do with Path to Agility is to start and vision what's really happening from an agile transformation perspective. And what we feel like the first step is, is all around alignment and alignment around why. Why, 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 why change? What what is, what is going to motivate people? What, uh, are we aligned around how we're going to change? How we're going to approach this? Are we going to do Big Bang and change all everybody at once? Are we going to do this in waves? Um, how are we going to enable people? How are we going to support people? How are we going to communicate the change? How are we going to handle things from an organizational change management perspective? Are we all aligned around that? Or at a team level, are we aligned around team agreements and definition of done and how we're going to work? Right, so align is our, our first stage of path to agility. And then we get into what we call learn. The easy part about learn is like go to training and get educated. But does learning truly happen in the classroom? Or does learning happen when we go to apply the things that we heard in the classroom? Right, I would say a lot of, a lot of training in the classroom is actually right on that border of align. It's aligning us all around the same terminology, but then we learn by doing. Right. We got to go start practicing these things. And then we learn, oh, you know what? Yeah, Bob, Bob taught me that I need to break my work down. And now I'm trying to break my work down. And that's hard. Right. Like it, I get it why I should do it. But it's difficult for me to figure out how do I decompose a story and then still meet, you know, like invest criteria. Right. So so learning is taking time. And so what our learn stage is really about is creating a learning culture. Right. Uh, you know, it's like we're doing meaningful retrospectives and we're taking action, right, that we're learning how to get better as an organization. And that's a foundational element for agile transformation to get to that stage of predictability. So 60, 70, 67 percent of y'all said you're in improving agility. Think about where improving agility is. It's like we're down here. Sometimes improving agility when you dig into it is really like we're churning down here and we haven't persevered through. And sometimes it's, we're not making some of the organizational changes, like removing some of the organizational impediments that we need to, in order to get to a more predictable organization. One of those biggest ones is, are we actually changing to have truly cross-functional teams, right? And when we, or right-sizing teams, right? Like if, if we don't make some of those changes, which are structural, which could impact organizational dynamics and reporting structures and other things, when we don't make those changes, it prevents us from getting to some of these higher levels of, of maturity from an agile perspective and getting more predictable. And predictability, a lot of people say they want speed, they want fast. But we feel like if you're not very predictable and you say go faster, right, like you're just putting more noise in the system. So predictability is really about getting the sources of volatility like reducing the sources of volatility. And let's think about what causes volatility, assuming most of y'all are, you know, uh, in, in like a technology area, right? Like it could be uh, quality issues cause, cause us to have volatility because we get interruptions. It could be changing priorities all the time causes us to have volatility. It could be lots of dependencies across teams and, and therefore we're not cross-functional enough and we're not responsive enough. So that causes us to have a lot of wait times in between, right? We're throwing things over the wall, right? Those are things that we start looking at in the predictability stage to say, hey, how do we reduce that? Sometimes we talk about scaling by descaling, right? How do we simplify the system of work so that we can reduce the complexity so that we can actually be more predictable? And then we can optimize for speed, like delivering fast, reducing cycle time, DevOps, test automation, continuous integration, all those things come into play. And I didn't even put the fifth stage in the survey and based on the data, you know why, right? And the fifth stage is what we call adapt, which is really about product learning. Are we adapting as an organization based on what the market is demanding? Are we shifting? Are we responding? Are we testing and learning quickly? Well, we can only test and learn quickly if we can deliver quickly. We can't deliver quickly if we aren't predictable. We can't get predictable if we don't have a learning culture and we can't get a learning culture if we don't have everybody aligned around 
trying to make this change, right? And, and motivated for this change, which is gonna be difficult uh, along the way. Bob, anything you wanna add here before? Yeah, and, and uh, everything that David's talking about, uh, I mean, it's, it's not easy, it's hard. It's like when you get into that chaos and resistance, um, that's when most people, teams, and organizations kind of give up, or they're like, oh, this is not working. Let's go try something else. Because um, it's kind of hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's like a, I have a big mountain range behind me here. And if you ever walk in the mountains, you, you look at a mountain, you kind of go up a mountain, and you get to the top of it. And now you can see past that mountain. And there's just, there's just a bigger mountain there right, <laughs> that you have to do. It's like, uh, it's it's challenging. Yeah. So, so what we're going to hit on is kind of three of the top impediments we feel, Bob and I feel, that organizations face. So why are, you know, again, why are we struggling with this? So that's what we're going to walk through uh, today. So our number one impediment that we see, the biggest pattern I see is, I kind of put it this way sometimes, trying to implement all the things in the picture without being clear about what the outcome is that we want. So in, in the picture could be, you know, the safe picture, like, hey, we're just trying to do all the practices or we're trying to do all the scrum things. So we're trying to do, and so a lot of times we're focused on the practices first without clarity of what's the mission, what's the, what's the outcome that we really want. So what you're gonna find with Path to Agility is we're totally focused on what are the outcomes and capabilities we're trying to develop prior to thinking about what are the practices that we need to implement. Once we understand the outcomes we want, then we'll figure out the right practices. So the impact of implementing solutions are just kind of trying to do agile, if you will, without being clear about the why, right? The business objective of why we do it. It causes a number of kind of um, things, right? So could be lots of resistance. I don't know why they're making me do agile, right? Um, I think agile's stupid. Agile, like at this point, almost everybody's had some kind of agile experience and, and they're this company or the last company. And, and a lot of them are bad based on like the survey that we saw. So a lot of people are kind of like, agile doesn't work. My last company, they tried it, it didn't work. And, and well, maybe it just wasn't a good implementation, right? That's what all of us are trying to help, help with. But so if we're not clear about it's not that we're trying to do agile. It's that we're trying to um, maybe maybe the goal is we need to deliver our products faster and be more responsive to the market because if we're not, our competitors are, and we're going to start losing market share, and that's going to impact our ability to make the impact in the world that we want to as an organization, right? So our goal is we're trying to deliver faster. That's our goal, not to do agile. Agile should enable that, right? But how are we going to measure success if you said our goal is to do, you know, to do agile? How do you know when you're agile enough? Right? Like that's that's not a measurable thing, right? Agility enables other stuff, right? So we want to we're, we're going to talk about what those other things could be. Um, if there's not clarity of what we're trying to achieve, how are we going to measure success? How do we know that we're all aligned towards the same mission? Right? Because at this point, if I asked a definition of agile from the 33 people that we have today, do you think we're gonna have the same answer? Or we might have 33 answers, right? You know, like there's no clear, like if, if I'm communicating that we wanna do agile. Now, if I said we need to reduce our delivery from three to six month cycles to three to six week cycles, Right, that there's some clarity of like how how do we we need to get products out every three to six weeks, not every three to six months. Um, so that can lead to minimal gain. So what we do, um, whoops, y'all have already started answering this question. I think. All right. So how do you define good agility? How would you know if there was good agility? So let's you can uh, you should be able to just kind of fill in a text box there, and we'll see some some things pop up. Maybe. Let me see. Feels like, feels like it wasn't updating. Oh, I forgot to hit the right button there. Do y'all see that question? Uh, we're seeing a, there we go. Okay. Look like it. Sometimes the poll everywhere will not refresh. 
All right, here we go. All right, so we're seeing some things in here. Um, I see some speed stuff. I see some, I like the good relationship and engagement with business partners, team working well together. So there's some dynamics of kind of uh, stakeholder and team happiness or engagement. Um, there's like valuable software, right? Motivated teams, um, team working and delivering. Whoop, it keeps moving on me. Results. <laughs> I like that one. Team working and delivering results that people love and want, right? Frequent release of work, customer satisfaction. So what I don't see in here is um, they do daily standups and they use Jira and, right? I don't see a lot of practices written out here and that's good, right? That's not the way to evaluate if we have good agility is that we're going through the motions we know if if you look at what y'all written here, are these practices, things you do, like how, or are these more outcomes, right? Impacts, maybe capabilities. We have the capability to deliver quickly, right? We, we have the capability that we frequently release. Um, we, but we, we have the capability to change and pivot. Right? We have the ability to shift priority. Those are kind of capabilities. So path to agility is a capability model where we've modeled 85 capabilities that roll up into 26 agile outcomes. And so that's what you're going to kind of see is that those are the important things for us to measure. What you've written here are more the capabilities of doing things that are enabling outcomes like customer satisfaction. That's what this stuff is really all about. And that's, what we, that's the lens that we want you to start kind of thinking from, and then we'll figure out what practices. So often we start like this. We go, all right, we want, we want faster. CEO says, I want, I want faster. And then we have something over here on the right, uh, agile practices. And it's like, all right, we're going to do scrum. We're going to do safe. We're going to do less. We're going to do uh, Nexus, you know, Kanban, whatever. How do we get from one to the other? Right? And, that, and that's one of the things that we're trying to make sense of with the Path to Agility Transformation Framework is that we think there's something missing between these two levels. Um, and David, David, really quick. Uh, yeah. yeah for, for those, just wanted to jump in really quick. For those of you that are maybe scrum masters or coach, I'm sure that probably all of you, if you're in one of those uh, roles, probably had, a, probably had to uh, address a question from uh, the team why do we do these daily, these stupid daily scrubs, right? Not just because Scrum says we should do them, right? Uh, my my uh, my joke is, you know, you know, how does a sprint get off track? One day at a time, right? Um, but um, you know, this is now, you know, as we go through this more, uh, it's gonna. It, I think the light bulbs go off, and and you can answer those questions maybe in a different way, right? Um, we're doing this daily Scrum because uh, you know we we want to get better at delivering value to our customers. Uh, uh, we want to increase cus customer satisfaction and respond to our market. That's why we do stuff like this, right? Um, but David's going to fill in the, the middle parts here. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of meetings in Scrum, Bob. Yes, there is. Right, we have so many more meetings now because of, because of Scrum. Yeah, it's just meetings all the time. All right, that's why we call them events, right? Because those sound cooler, right, than a bunch of meetings, right? It's Scrum events. All right, so... What we, what we, how we approach things is we say, all right, first thing we got to identify is what are the business outcomes that we want? What's the why, right? From, a, from not, not from an agile standpoint, but from a business standpoint. And then what we've done is we've mapped out 26 kind of standard agile outcomes that, that we, we find the patterns that are out there. Um, and then that dictates kind of what capabilities that we need. And then we'll figure out what practices would support that. So we want to prioritize the business outcome, then the agile outcome, then the capability that we're going to work on, and then figure out the practice. And then those will enable um, back up the chain. So what we're going to look at next um, is kind of these, these four different levels of practices, kind of the how. Capability is like this new ability the organization or the team has developed, right? The capability to 
uh, get done done every two weeks, right? Like that's that's a capability of a team to not have carryover. That gives the outcome of we can deliver in a more predictable kind of cadence of delivery that enables a, a, an overall business outcome um, for the organization that might be more customer satisfaction or transparency. So we, we have these nine business outcomes and this is an activity that we do uh, this is usually the first thing when we engage with a leadership team. One of the first things that we'll do is we'll ask the leadership team uh, to, to prioritize and say, all right, why are y'all doing this agile thing? Why, do it, why are you doing an agile transformation? Why do you want to change? Whatever, whatever transition, agile adoption, whatever word you use, why? And you, you know, what, what do you think the first response of like the, the C-suite or the leaders when you put this in front of them, they're like, well I, well, I want all of these, right? All of these are important. Yeah, okay, now we're going to introduce you to the first concept of Agile, which is called limiting WIP or limiting work and process. You only get to pick two or three of these, and you got to figure out which one is the most important. So I want you to pick for, for you, for your organization, um, which one do you think is the most important? for your organization. And, and, and I think it'll keep, does it, uh, it's keeping the, is the poll still open? I think, I think it should, right? Just let me know if it goes down, but like, I want you to have the descriptions here. Um, which one of these is the most important for your organization? And as we, as we start to, you look at these, you'll start to see that there's some dependency amongst these, right? One could unlock the other. And one other thing we'll do at framing with the, with the leadership team is to kind of say, all right, there might be a difference of what you want ultimately versus what we need to do in the next three to six months, right? Ultimately, it might be about customer sat, but we have quality issues today that would help us unlock customer satisfaction. So let's see what's coming in here. Aha, customer, this is a customer sat team. Okay, so 47% so far is the big winner on customer sat. Um, and then we got a two-way tie for second. Oh, three-way tie now. So we got some horse racing going on here. All right, market responsiveness is in second place. And uh, then we got speed and productivity. Um, the, it's it, this will create an interesting conversation for your leaders. And you can play the same game with them, right? To say, all right, let's pick what out of these and have this conversation and have this debate. If you polled them as they walked into the room, if you said, hey, do you think y'all are all on, in alignment on your priorities of why we're doing Agile? Do you think they probably would say, oh, yeah, we're all we're all aligned. And then you do this activity and you're like, y'all just picked seven out of the nine things, right? Like you're not, you know, most of the time, yeah, there's clear, clear with customer set. And then what we want to do is have a, a conversation and say, all right, how would we define success of that? Right. How, what would be the kind of objective, maybe the key results of customer satisfaction? So we'll drill into uh, drill into that. So, again, there's a relationship amongst these things um, that we would we would look at. Now, let's talk about impediment number two. Right? And I know this one's near and dear to Bob's heart. Right. So uh, we call it not approaching as an organizational wide change um, or thinking this is just a team level problem. Oops, there we go. Bob, it's just, it's just, it, all the work's done by the teams, right? Leaders don't yeah. do anything. So it, don't we just need to train the teams and like, this will be good? Yeah, it's funny. I've been doing this for a very long time. And this is something I almost run, almost always run into when I'm working with an executive team and the, and the, the associated scrum teams. Um, there's always this, uh, this thinking that, oh, well, scrum, that's something the teams do, right? So just, just let us know what you need for them and go off and go work with the teams. We'll be good, right? Where you need to take a holistic uh, approach. Like if you come from uh, if you come from the world of, of lean, it's about optimizing the whole, right? Not suboptimizing. Yeah, and 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 I I uh, the second bullet there, empowering the resistance. What do you think would happen if the leaders say, "Hey, y'all need to go do agile." And then the team start trying to uh, adopt agile and the team escalates an issue, an organizational impediment that's in their way. And then the leaders don't take action on it. What signal does that send to the team about how serious we are? Right. So, so one of the things we talk a lot about is with a transformation, are we building 
whatever term you want to use, guiding coalition or agile leadership team or change team, or are the leaders going to uh, monitor the organizational impediments and remove those impediments quickly, right? And if they're not, then all of a sudden the team's going to be like, okay, they're not serious. I'm just going to wait this out because this isn't going to go anywhere. And you think that might lead to superficial agility, right? Or, or where we're just kind of stuck floundering and improving agility, right? So it, 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 it can lead to a ceiling really quick if all we're doing is approaching things at team level. So what we look at with Path to Agility is a lens of it's not just a team level problem. We definitely need to do things at the team level, right? Um, and at this point, in, in Agile's, uh, you know, history, like we are at the point where there is the most documentation about how team level agility works and what we can do from a scrum perspective. There's you know, more books than ever about that level of stuff. But what we're finding is there's also this kind of what we call system level problem. And here we're not talking about the technical system. We're talking about the system of work or the system of value delivery, right? Most of you work at companies where you're of a certain size or enterprise size that it takes multiple teams to get work out the door. In some cases, it could be a system of 150 people, right? Or 15 teams that are working together to get a product out the door. And if we're not optimizing that system, as Bob said, kind of looking from a lean lens and looking at optimizing the whole from the and for flow and theory of constraints and all that stuff through the system, right? That's a really big part. And that's where a lot of our scaling techniques that have emerged over the last decade are really trying to help us optimize the system level of work. But there's also a third level, which is from an organizational lens. Right, and here's where from a leadership dynamic, uh, organizational structure, culture, mindset, uh, people practices, finance practices, those things need to shift too. And many of you who uh, said, I think the 70% that were in uh, improving agility, it's likely that your challenges are not at the team level. They're at the system and organizational level. The things that are keeping you from getting too predictable are not things that a team on their own can solve. They're things that we need to optimize at either the system or organizational uh, level from a dynamic. It could be how we're funding things, or you know, we're more project focused versus product focused. We're not creating cross functional teams. We don't have cross functional systems, whatever that might be. Um, we need to we need to look at. And so by looking at this through this lens, we can start to identify, all right, what elevation is the problem that we're facing so that we can start to attack um, attack that. And so the last impediment is what I call no method to the madness is that if you get, um, it's always fun if you get uh, the most dysfunctional team I've ever facilitated is a team of agile coaches. Um, <laughs> Right, you know, because every agile coach has an opinion, and the the thing is, if you get a bunch of agile coaches in a room, they'll all say like, "All right, this is the most important agile thing that we should do," or "This is the most important agile thing," or "This is the most important agile thing." And and if we all looked at a problem, we could all come up with a bunch of things to do. So the question is, where do we start? What's the next right step to take from an agile transformation perspective? It's not that any of those answers from those Agile coaches were wrong. It's just, do we have clarity of the next action we should take that would move the needle towards the business outcomes that we selected? So if we don't have clarity of kind of our approach to a transformation, then what happens is either everybody's kind of, I, I used to call our, uh, our consulting model you know, uh, internally, not to not the clients, but I used to like, if I characterize how we worked before, it was like, all right, I hired smart people and I sent them out to do smart things, but everybody was doing their own thing on every island that they are working. And so that was part of why we started to create Path to Agility internally before we exposed it externally is to go, look, I can't have every coach, especially within an engagement, like we've had some large clients like Southwest Airlines and Anthem Healthcare and Humana. And like, you, I can't have a whole team of coaches out there just do, winging it in all these different places, right? And, and then more and more, we have coaching teams within the client that we're having to coordinate with, right? And it's like, all right, we all need to be working from the same sheet of music. Um, I, I, I'm inspired by all the guitars behind Bob over there, right? So we got to work from the same sheet of music. So 
we got to have clarity of alignment on how we're approaching things. And we've got to have a roadmap for our transformation. And, and so what we started to do is to lay out a map uh, within Path to Agility to be able to say, all right, given those three stages or five stages in the three levels, what are the ads? These are the 26 agile outcomes that I mentioned. What are the agile outcomes that we're trying to uh, achieve? And um, and there's a, a relationship to business outcomes. I don't know if I have that that slide in here, but um, you know, if we're after speed, then what we've correlated is to say for for the speed business outcome or customer sat is what y'all chose. We then correlated like these would be the eight most important agile outcomes for you to focus on, but there's dependency, right? You see these arrows that are kind of behind there and, and, and a transformation is messy, right? Like there is no one path through this. And, and so the notion is if, if we said um, we're, whoops, we're focused on predictable delivery cadence at a team level, right? We need that in order to get multi-team predictability at the system level. And that would enable us to get to faster time to value but in order to get to predictable delivery cadence, we need team ownership and we need team formation. We need to make sure we have the right teams aligned to value, the right system of teams. And all this kind of drives back to, do we have a compelling purpose for change? So what we can start to do is create kind of a heat map of, of an assessment of kind of green, yellow, red on where we are to then start to inform the next steps that we want to take. So with Path to Agility, what we're trying to do is say, What's the guidance for your agile transformation in an outcome-based, capability-based way so that you can measure progress of, of how we're doing, but it informs kind of those next steps that we would take in an, again, focus on capabilities, not just saying, oh, we need to do more agile or better safe or better scrum or you know, whatever that might be. So again, tying back to those, those business outcomes that we have. So we're going to... Um, so I'm just going to hit on a couple couple things here, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, so uh, we're going to work with Rob to get a uh, Path to Agility practitioner class. Um, it's a one day offering for a workshop um, in your in y'all's area around kind of introducing. And so this is kind of like a leading change, leading transformation workshop enabled with Path to Agility. And so we call that the Path to Agility Practitioner. Um, so uh, look for more information about that. Um, if you, you can, I think, respond to in the poll um, just with your, with your email um, and we'll send all the slides in the, the pitfalls uh, white paper around Agile transformation and some more information about Path to Agility um, around that. But what questions do y'all have? What's what's kind of surface for y'all around this? Um, if some of you guys want, we can use the uh, chat feature if you have any questions or rather than really trying to talk over each other, um, maybe say you have a question, I'll, we'll call you out. But yeah. uh, certainly don't be bashful because I know all of you guys, or a lot of you mm -hmm. and in class, at least when uh, you've been with chat, you haven't been bashful at all about talking. And why, why people are thinking of maybe questions they have, uh, What's really nice about this, if you're if you're able to create this kind of holistic mindset and buy-in across the organization, and you have a compelling vision of what you're trying to accomplish with your transformation, if you're one of those people that are working maybe at the team level, um, and uh, you you're you're having your team is having some impediments, like like David mentioned, maybe you don't have a cross-functional team, which usually results in a lot of dependencies. You can use that as ammunition to go back to your leaders to say, you know. In, in our in our in our mission and our vision, you know, one of the one of the uh, priorities were things like you know, uh, customer satisfaction, being more predictable, you know, market responsiveness. We're not going to get there if we can't re if we can't create more cross functional teams and remove some of these dependencies, right? Yeah. 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 So uh, there is a question that uh, came in, and I'm just pulling up a. Uh, yeah, I was going to show something tied to Bob's and then I'll answer that uh, people leader question that's in there. So so it, it, sometimes you can use this map. Are you all seeing uh, a slide with green, yellow, red? OK, yes. I, didn't make it, I didn't the box. I lost the zoom box around it. So sometimes it's kind of like point to where it hurts. Right. You know, and and 
And how do you create a context to have a conversation with leaders around where the pain is? What is it that we're feeling? And, and again, to what Bob was saying, to be able to articulate, oh, so we're having a problem here. Now let's talk about what practices we could do in order to enable that to be better, right? Or help them see, like, I'm feeling this pain that we're not, we're not delivering things quickly. Well, we're not delivering things quickly because we don't have these other things up, up front earlier, right? And you're just trying to go crack a whip on people and trying to get them to go faster. Um, the uh, question around the people leader, uh, yeah, so, so there's, def there's a theme in here around team empowerment, agile leadership, decision agility, and purpose-driven leadership that, that hits on that kind of um, evolution of an agile leader that we're trying to help guide um, because that, that, that leadership uh, role. Now, we're, again, we're not, we're not going to specifically in Path to Agility prescribe a how, right, to say like um, leaders can't manage the team or, you know, something like that. But we, we would talk about what does empowerment mean? How can a leader move to more of a kind of coaching leadership catalyst leader type of role versus being somebody that is trying to taskmaster and and tell everybody what to do um let's see marie's got a question uh how do you find the right mix of people for the group which which group are you referring to marie the team like the team or change team maybe maybe add that in the chat um a little clarification there. Okay, there we go. Um, do, do, do. Let's see. What else do we got? Yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't. I, I didn't see in there what uh, what specifically uh, Marie was talking about. But uh, we didn't get into it. We didn't. Have, we weren't, didn't really have time. But uh, if you're talking about, you know, who's going to be your, if you're going back to, you know, change frameworks. You know, who's going to be your guiding con coalition your agile transformation team it's the leaders in your organization that can influence change right yeah yeah and um and then uh stacy's got a question around understanding teams are self-empowered do you think governance is helpful or harmful for agile transformation so i got a belief on this one you can't walk into a team or or a organization for that matter, an agile leadership team who's never led a transformation before and say, all right, self-organize, right? Like you've never done it before, self-organize, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's where path to agility comes in to say, all right, what we've done is taken organizational change management patterns, agile adoption patterns that were all in all these coaches' heads and try to get that intelligence out of our heads and into this kind of uh, it, it, into this product. Um, and what that's done is allowed leaders to then, you know, we'll do activities where we'll say, okay, let's prioritize based on kind of this heat map and say, all right, let's now start to build a transformation backlog based on this. Without this, you can't just go, all right, you've never done a transformation before, build a transformation backlog. Right. They, you don't know what to put on there. Same thing at a team level. Hey, you've never done scrum before self-organize. Right. Like, so that's yeah. where we say, all right, let's put them in a training. Let's teach them. Let's arm them with the knowledge to be able to do it. This is kind of similar to say, let's arm people with the knowledge to be able to guide agile transformation change. Um, so, so over time, that team should become more self-organizing. Right. But we've got to we've got to we've got to lead them. Right. We got to teach them to fish. Right. We can't just say, all right, you never fished before. Go figure it out. Self-organize. Right. All right. Um, Anne's got a question. We're taking the gradual approach of slowly bringing on teams and with appreciation of self-managing teams. One of the struggles is that you need some consistency. Um, consistency being from a uh, scaling kind of certain certain things standardizing across teams i'm i'm assuming okay i see Anne's uh, nodding yeah I, I definitely agree that from a scaling perspective there are certain there's a point where you can't just say all right everybody do it whatever way you want y'all are all fully empowered right and it's like okay we're gonna deliver every six weeks because we think it's the right thing, right? So there are certain times when you're going to need to make some decisions about 
hey, um, is it important for us to align that we're all doing Scrum or, is, or do we have options? Can we do Scrum and or Kanban? Are those options or not, right? Is there a reason why we'd make that decision? Are we flexible on sprint length or is it that together we're gonna say, you know what? We, we think it's, there's, there's value in us aligning our sprint cadences and being delivering on every two weeks because then we can all release together. We can all get to a good quality state. Um, estimation, are we going to do that in a consistent way so that we can roll things up, right? Like those are decisions that we, we need to make conscious decisions of there's a value in the standardization or the consistency without um, stifling the, the empowerment, right? And there are, so there are, there are definitely are times when I, I believe some of those decisions uh, need to be made, but ideally they're made with representatives of the teams right you know in a way not the vp is going to make a decision that everybody's going to follow right that then that's where you get into communities of practice or uh, that agile leadership team that's a representation like something that's a representation of the group that is making some of those decisions together um, and getting feedback on it and testing and learning right and and being open to to that yeah, and in, uh, in the early poll when we were talking about the business outcomes, uh, nobody really voted on in innovation, right? But that's a part of this as well, right? Uh, you know, as uh, change leaders, uh, work, you know, and leaders in an organization, we certainly have some ideas around how we think things should work, right? But um, we're, we should be open to ideas as well, so we can uh, take these ideas and we can and we can test and validate and see is that a good idea? Should we try it? Should we adjust it a little bit? Should we do something different? Yeah, so the next question is around technical practices from Cliff around uh, how much are technical practices like automated testing, TDD, uh, tied into P2A, um, drill down into, yeah, so you, you hit on it, um, quality feedback loop shortened. So these, these two down here, so actually we've got this, this view that kind of hits on, but the two that are down here are kind of what we call more of a technical agility um, space. Uh, and so quality feedback loop shorten is definitely some of the practices would be continuous integration and test automation release continuously would be a lot more of the like automated deployment and DevOps type of capabilities. Um, so, so DevOps practices could be the answer to how to develop capabilities in these two areas. Um, so yeah, that, that you know, de to me, uh, an agile transformation and a DevOps transformation go hand in hand. Um, you're not going to get very far without um, without the other on that. Um, all right, Bob, next question is for you. Um, where do team employees report to for career development, discipline, HR issues, et cetera? Yeah, so um, I don't think that changes with path to agility, right? I mean, it's it's whatever your organization, what what you know, what, how they're structured, you know, what what are you doing currently? We might want to look and reevaluate that, right? But uh, you know, probably team members still have their same reporting structure, and hopefully, the leaders that they're working with are are are, are kind of uh, you know focused on on you know helping them kind of grow and learn, making sure they have the right skills. Right, handling issues that we can't resolve at the team team level, uh, so that that doesn't really change with all this. Uh, this P two A is just more, you know, how can we think about this holistic and get a better understanding of why are we going through all this, right? And what are some things we can do to get there? Yeah, it, and yeah, from a leadership, it's it's less about again the answer of how reporting would be, and more of what's the leadership journey. Right from a traditional leader to an agile leader, right. right, or to have more leadership agility, right? We would provide guidance around that, um, but not necessarily. There's lots of different ways that we've seen kind of reporting structure work, right? Um, you know, is it matrix? You know, do you still have functional leaders, and you've got a dev leader and a QA leader, and and therefore the team has, you know, has people from multiple leaders, or is there a leader over the team, you know, manager over the, the, the team, you know, I've seen both of those work, right, like, and, and usually what we find from an agile transformation perspective is um, the path of least resistance might be, let's not change the organizational structure right away, 
and let's just start building the cross-functional teams and then let's see where that evolves. Um, and then I've had other cases. I had had a uh, one of my first clients where the it was a smaller organization. So the fair warning, it was uh, where they had like five, six teams, but he took all the, the managers and basically removed all the people from reporting to them and just said, all right, you guys as a management team are now all uh, working as one, one unit uh, together because they were highly task mastering and he didn't want to just reassign them to a new agile. They were moving from component teams to feature teams. And he knew if he just put them over the feature team, everybody was just going to follow the model of I take orders from the manager. And yeah. he just removed, he neutered them from their powers and they had no ability to do any of those things. And then the teams learned how to work on their own. And then about two months later, he, he then put the, the new reporting structure in place. That was a drastic thing, but it was highly impactful and led to quicker change than, than many organizations uh, tend to do. Yeah, and, and that's what's powerful about this framework, you know, like uh, especially around leadership. If, if uh, we, you know, we're working with the leadership team and we decided uh, or they decided that, that uh, employee, employee engagement was really important to them, um, that might get into some leadership models. If the leadership model uh, is currently, you know, more of that command and control, signing the work, tracking the work, uh, that's probably going to impact employee engagement, right? They're probably just going to do what they're told to do, right? So we can start talking about, uh, well, if you want to start moving in that direction of employee engagement, uh, we're going to need to figure out a way to give the teams uh, more autonomy and control over how they accomplish their outcomes, but we'll still stop and check along the way. Yeah. All right. So Rob, I see we're coming up on time um, yeah. and just oh. for, for kind of where we've got a couple more questions here, but yeah. I'm happy to stay on uh, afterwards if people still have questions, but just for yeah. respect for everybody else. Um, yeah, I mean, what we, we could, yeah, if anybody up. has to drop at seven, uh, at 656 here, you can drop. I know Royce has a question and I want to make sure we address that for him. Okay. Um, but um, what I'll do for everybody, first, I'll, I'll say thanks to Bob and David for taking an hour and hanging out with us in uh, Metro Detroit and some of my friends across the country. I will email all of you with a link to the video if you want to catch up and show it to any colleagues. Um, and, you know, I, I really, for me, when I heard about Path to Agility, it sort of connected a lot of dots from a lot of different conversations I've had with Agilists and clients and just, just people in general. So I wanted to share it with you because for one, it, it just, it made me feel like okay, we have something that I can share with you that would help your organization as opposed to you just saying, okay, I'm going to go take a scaled agile class or I'm going to go take a less class. It's sort of, you know, it's sort of agnostic as to which framework you're using or, you know, yeah. if it's safe or less or scrum or whatever. But, yeah. um, and, and it's something that um, uh, several of the coaches that I work with and some of the trainers I work with for my advanced classes work with David and it's something that, uh, you know, if it's Bob or Scott Dunn, who some of you might know, or some of the other coaches that I've interacted with, or, you know, and, and especially when we're talking about people in the leadership stuff, I work on with Pete Barron's, it sort of fits in this whole path to agility framework. So it, it made me a little more excited and uh, about this. And I am going to, um, you know, um, again, thanks guys. Stick around, Royce. I want to make sure we answer the question. If I'm leaving this on uh, the video, so if you're going to, Royce had one question. How do you show incremental value? Um, you see that yeah. one, uh, David? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and thanks, thanks for thanks for having us. Um, and uh, let's see. So, Royce, um, whoops, I, it was there, and then more chat. Okay, show incremental value executing a large project or program. Yeah, I mean, I think you know the 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 bias towards from an agile standpoint is trying to say how can we get feedback earlier and smaller things, but knowing it, I think it's a little baked into kind of your question is like, there are times when we're replacing an old pro legacy product or, you know, something to that effect where it's just like, Hey, we can't, it's harder to do a incremental, you know, re release of the initial uh, kind of thing. So um, for me, I don't know, Bob, what, what your thoughts are, you know, it's like, how do we look at, getting feedback loops shorter 
even though we know we might not be able to get it all the way into production and get that type of feedback until say a year down the road. What is it that we're doing to reduce the risk of a big bang blowing up on us, right? Um, that's, that's one of the things that I, I look at and saying, all right, how are we measuring progress through working product, not just measuring progress by, you know, hitting milestones or, you know, things like that. Bob, you have any thoughts? Yeah. And I mean, in, in situations like that, you may not be able to deliver until a certain point in time, but, uh, you know, we're going to use a, an iterative and incremental approach to, because a lot of it depends on what value, what, what kind of value you're talking about, right? Because value can mean a lot of different things, right? So some of that incremental value could just be uh, risk mitigation, um, learning, inspecting and adapting, making sure that we're kind of headed in that right direction. Now, if your value is something like return on investment, uh, you're probably not going to see that until you actually deliver, right? But we can uh, we can use the iterative and incremental approach to, you know, to learn, get feedback, mitigate risk, uh, test out our assumptions. So that's the value maybe we're getting incrementally. Yeah. Cool. Royce, that answer everything for you? It's a good thumbs up for me, guys. Yeah. All right, good. All right, thanks, Royce. All right, well, thanks for all the great questions and uh, and uh, thanks for having us tonight, Rob. Hey, thank you guys, I appreciate thank it. Um, all right, I'll stick around. Uh, anybody else? Uh, I'm gonna hit the record button now so we can go offline for... Uh... Thanks, guys.